Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute's Lunch and Learn Seminar Series. My name is Paige Shi. I'm the Strategic Partners Officer for GTMI. GTMI is part of the Georgia Tech Research Enterprise and one of Georgia Tech's um, 11 interdisciplinary research institutes that focuses uniquely on manufacturing research, development, and deployment. We tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and help our partners move innovations from the lab to the market. GTMI has a wide variety of facilities and equipment located uh, on the main campus, as well as nearby on 14th Street in our Applied Research uh, Facility, Advanced Manufacturing Pilot Facility. GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, and thought leadership. GTMI hosts a Lunch and Learn series each semester. This fall, sessions are held every Monday at noon as live online events. These sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, students, and researchers, as well as our global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. To ensure a seamless presentation experience today, all audience members are automatically muted. I strongly encourage all audience members to use the Q&A panel on your screen to submit any questions you have for the speaker as they come to mind. We'll reserve the end of the hour for addressing audience questions submitted via this panel. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Jill Engelcox and Samantha Ventries from the U.S. National Renewal, who will present Supply Chain for Energy Technologies. This summer, Georgia Tech and NREL signed an MOU to facilitate expanded project collaboration. Dr. Engelcox is director of the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis at the U.S. National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL. Over her 30-year career, Dr. Engelcox has been an engineer, researcher, program manager, and strategic planner for a diverse suite of renewable energy, clean technology, and environmental programs in the United States, Asia, and Middle East. Her first job was climbing smokestacks in Los Angeles, followed by leading industrial pollution prevention programs for small and medium-sized businesses and R&D labs in the United States and internationally. In the past decade, she has led international strategic planning and technology assessments for renewable energy and environmental sustainability research programs, working extensively in Malaysia and Saudi Arabia. She also teaches a course on energy issues for the University of Colorado, Denver, Global Energy Manu Management Program, and Industrial Processes and Environmental Communications courses at Johns Hopkins University Engineering for Professionals program. Ms. Reese is a senior engineer at the Strategic Energy Analysis Center at NREL. As an analyst, Samantha helps put early stage research programs in context of techno-economic trade-offs and analytically shows technology potential through supply chain analysis, trade flow mapping, market research, and building bottoms up cost models. Prior to joining NREL, she helped transition products from R&D to volume manufacturing, spending considerable time working around the world and more specifically in Asia. Samantha's background is in mechanical and electrical engineering. She received her MS in engineering and applied science from Yale University and her BS in engineering and applied science from California Institute of Technology. Welcome, Jill and Samantha. You may get, begin your presentation. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Samantha and I are going to uh, tag team this presentation. So I will uh, give the first part and then uh, a little bit more in depth. So Sam, if you want to go ahead to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to give a quick overview of, of NREL and uh, the Joint Institute and a little bit about the MOU, recent MOU with Georgia Tech that was mentioned. And then Sam will cover the, uh, the topic on uh, supply chains uh, for the remainder of the presentation. And then we'll both be available for questions at so if you go to the next slide. So just a, uh, a quick update or uh, uh, a presentation or mention of uh, who NREL is. NREL is one of the 17 U.S. Department of Energy National Laboratories. We are located uh, just west of Denver, Colorado in Golden. Up there. And if we go to the next slide, um, we're part of the uh, – so NREL is uh, – the national lab that is dedicated completely to renewable energy and energy efficiency, uh, but that also includes sustainable transportation, renewable power systems, and the integration of these systems together. So this is a picture of our campus, um, our main campus, and then the photo on the right is a test site. 
Uh, plus, we have some other locations in Alaska and Washington, D.C. area. Almost 3,000 employees um, and really focused on the full suite of renewable energy technologies uh, that you can see listed here. And that also includes the, uh, the supply chains for all of those technologies and how those technologies are manufactured uh, and how they um, uh, go from raw materials to process materials to deployment. So that's going to be a little bit of what we discuss uh, today. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis is a partnership between NREL and a number of universities. And it was set up about 11 years ago to be able to do a systems approach. So looking not just at the technologies and the development of those, how they intersect with, uh, for example, the supply chain. Uh, and so a lot of the manufacturing uh, supply chain analysis that NREL does started with, with the Joint Institute. Um, also how uh, renewables intersect with industrial systems, human systems, uh, ecosystems. Really, it's how you connect all these things together from a, from a resilient, sustainability economics perspective, taking a global and system view. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is a little bit about uh, the MOU that was recently signed uh, between NREL and Georgia Tech, signed this March, uh, but it was building on research collaborations uh, that have happened in recent years, uh, and those collaborations have resulted in over 60 peer-reviewed publications between co-authored by NREL and Georgia Tech um, on a number of different topics. Uh, some of the topics that are probably most relevant here are around energy materials. Uh, there's uh, novel materials for solar cells, um, as well as uh, around um, fuel cell performance, uh, biofuels production and biomass uh, processes. Processing uh, also has a strong manufacturing link uh, and a number of other different topics that are relevant today. Uh, the goal of the MOU is to uh, enhance collaboration between staff, faculty, and students at NREL and Georgia Tech with the goal of solving big problems, uh, engaging and sustaining human capital, so that's, that's all of us, uh, and then accelerating technology adoption uh, globally. And uh, there's also some work around uh, intellectual property that helps scale this technology dissemination. So if we go to the next slide. So this is a little more detail on technology focus areas of mutual interest. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on the last three as most relevant to our topic today. Uh, electrons to molecules to advance carbon capture and materials. So this is how we can capture carbon and turn it into valuable products. Uh, materials for energy applications. So that could be the solar uh, PV materials that I mentioned, but also a wide variety of other catalysts and other materials and then advanced manufacturing for energy applications being very specifically called out. Uh, and so this is the, the main technical areas that are defined in the, in, in the MOU. And then the next slide is specific benefits uh, and opportunities for people involved. So there's potential for um, uh, sharing offices, sharing staff, uh, sub, uh, faculty on sabbaticals, spending time at NREL, um, programmatic integration of researchers and faculty and students and how they can work together. There's an opportunity for, uh, for faculty and students from Georgia Tech to work at NREL once we reopen post-pandemic. Um, <laughs> and then uh, also there, and, and vice versa. And then also uh, research collaborations that uh, have graduate students come and spend time at NREL or work collaboratively on projects to develop new skills and research paths. We hire quite a few postdocs and graduate students to collaborate on our, on our work. So uh, I'm going to turn it over now, if we go to the next slide, to Sam to talk a little bit, um, to go into our technical topic today. But if there are questions on the MOU uh, or about NREL or JICIA, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. I'd be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. So Sam, it's over to you. All right, thanks, Jill. Um, so just to make sure everybody knows, I will definitely not go to the last minute. So there's going to be plenty of time for questions. And I really like it when I get questions. It like, makes me seem like people were listening. So please feel free to be using that um, and put them in as you think of them. And we can tackle them all at the end. As uh, was mentioned, I'm going to tackle techno-economic uh, analysis. And, and really, what does techno-economic analysis do? So if you go to Google Scholar and just 
Google, TEA, you will get a broad spectrum of what does this mean. It means different things depending on the project. What I look at it as is it provides data to put the research problems in context and have analytically show technology potential. It's going to quantify the impact of your research breakthroughs. It'll, um, on a more broad scale, it can show the impacts of domestic manufacturing. Um, and basically, we do this using supply chain and trade flow analysis. You know, this, these pieces are helpful to understand the geopolitical landscape, understanding the um, potential for material scarcity, and it highlights areas there could be bottlenecks. You know, we use various tools like bottom-up cost analysis, looking at trade flows, value at different stages. We use different metrics like component costs, system costs, value add, time. And one of the things that, you know, oftentimes if a researcher is not familiar with TEA, the question I get is why would I, like, be looking at this? You know, I really just want to improve my efficiency or make this new widget. And and one of the big things that, that, that you know, um, is important is as a researcher, oftentimes you are not thinking geopolitically of um, one of the examples will show, you know, certain materials only in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, if your research advance depends on that, there could be hindrances for it to ever reach wide scale adoption or understanding the bottoms up cost analysis, because in the lab, how you manufacture something oftentimes has very little overlap for what you're going to see when you actually go to volume manufacturing. So understanding how those processes work and where, as you are making your fundamental decisions, there could be an impact, um, it can be really important. And that's kind of where uh, TEA comes in, and specifically here at NREL, where um, I bring value to the fundamental researchers, is I pay attention to what are material scarcities, what are geopolitical risks, how does one actually do this in a volume manufacturing and I often like uh, really closely collaborate from very early stage uh, research to bring those um, pieces to the table so oftentimes my contribution to a product uh, project is I only sit in on some meetings but again you know as a researcher as you think about how you 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 do your your design decisions you know having somebody say hey if you use material a over material b really early on oftentimes there's they, they both look equal and you don't have a reason to try one over the other and once you have something working you're not going to go back uh, as likely until the very end of the project to go try the other one so you know I come and I say hey let's not use uh, kryptonite, it's all being used to torture Superman. So instead, how about if we use something that's readily available like 10? And all things being equal, this can help influence researchers to, to, to try that as their first uh, one, which is not to say you don't end up with a critical material, but but it can help um, make that decision um, when you have both equal paths. Okay, right, so for the rest of the talk, what I'm going to do is give some examples of how TEA has been used and uh, some of the outcomes and, and how this can both influence research, it can influence proposals that are writing, or the other thing that here at NREL we, we use it a lot for is helping inform different uh, policy entities of, of what is the effect of growth, the economy, and clean energy. So the first one I'm going to go over is benchmarking clean energy technology. Uh, this is a very busy slide that says basically we just published the latest version of what we call our uh, clean energy benchmark report. It focuses on silicon PV modules, LED packages, components that go into uh, wind, the wind turbine, and lithium ion batteries. And really, Getting right to the, the, the kickers, the big findings with China plays the largest role in supporting global demand for these technologies, that there are gaps between production and demand across the economies and supply chains were requiring extensive global trade network, which is probably no shock to everybody since now that there are supply chain problems, this is in the news all the time. Nothing like a ship going sideways in a canal to really mean supply chains are, are known to everybody. Um, and basically, for just these four technologies, and we looked across 13 economies, that, you know, um, there is over almost $90 billion of generation. So um, basically, as I described, these help inform manufacturing and policy decisions, and that includes R&D and international trade. So as I mentioned, we looked at four technologies. 
we did not um, look all the way back at the raw material for them, but we started with process material. So for PV, that's silic uh, polysilicon. For the wind turbines, um, even though, again, there are a lot of different process materials that can go into them, we focused on steel. For the batteries, this was the cathode and anode materials and the electrolytes. And for the LED packages, we looked at the sapphire substrates. Next, we looked at the subcomponents. So obviously for um, silicon PV, and that, uh, you then go from your polysilicon to a silicon wafer. You know, for LEDs, you go from sapphire substrate to a chip and so forth. And so then again, the end clean energy technology that we looked at was silicon PV, wind turbine components, so the blades, the towers, and the nautical, the use of lithium ion batteries in vehicles, and then LED packages. Uh, the economies we uh, concentrated on, um, these were decided early on in the project. We've done this report for three uh, years, 2014, 2015, 2016, where basically the, the, the economies that we knew from experience uh, were big players in these technologies. So Brazil, Canada, China, Denmark, Germany, India, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, South Korea, Taiwan, the UK, and the United States. And so what we were looking at is market trends, trade trends, and value add trends. One of the key things that for these technologies that we were doing is we were looking at both demand and production. Um, so one of the big challenges was understanding um, what was the capacity to manufacture the component. Now for something like a silicon wafer, that's really not so difficult to figure out because there are very set demand, uh, set of equipment that is necessary in order to do that. And so you can understand what is the production and how much of that equipment has um, uh, been shipped, and then you can get capacity. For things that are less equipment driven, you don't need big litho tools, you know, think more if you wanted to make an inverter. Technically, all you electrical engineers on the car call today could go make a PV inverter in your garage, right? You go to analog.com, you order some parts, you know, you use your electrical engineering know-how, and you could produce an inverter. So trying to understand the capacity in manufacturing for doing those kind of things are a lot more difficult. Um, so that was also a driver on some of the uh, the technologies that were chosen was that we would be able to both look at production and capacity to understand how all these different economies were playing. As you can see in across here, you that the amount of PV, for instance, in China from just 2014 to 2016, which is the last year of this report, had increased substantially. So the demand share is how much they themselves are consuming um, of the world supply in their own economies. Production-wise, actually, from 2014 to 2016, China actually went down a little bit. And now keep in mind, these are absolute percentages. So this is not how much was generated. This was how much each of these economies generated. And so obviously, the amount of PV uh, manufactured from 2014 to 2016 increased. It is just that other economies in the world um, came and were doing a little bit more. Um, here, it looks like it was uh, South Korea. Um, when you look in the LED world, you can see that uh, China actually jumped in just three short years substantially from a 38% share of producing the LED chip um, to 53%. The uh, battery world also, they went from only 13% that they were um, factored into to like between 40 and 38% in 2015, 2016. Oftentimes that recognize, uh, is uh, caused by fairly large facilities coming online. So um, you can also uh, see the US has a fairly large demand um, signal on EV batteries, although again, this was halved from 2014 to 2015. Now any specifics on, if you have questions on specifically why any of that may have happened for any of these different technologies, I will end up uh, sending you to this uh, report. Um, I can tell you anything you want to know about LEDs, but the other three technologies were not ones that I personally worked on. The other piece that we do with the uh, benchmark report is look at how much of the value add of manufacturing these technologies happen in the various economies. 
again, looking here on the very first bar of uh, 2014 for Brazil, what you can see is the vast majority of the value add for their consumption of clean energy technologies we are looking at actually stays within their own economy, the well over 80%. So that means that of the clean energy technologies they were consuming, they themselves generated over 80% of that value. That doesn't mean that's how many the widgets, it is the actual value. And um, I have an example later on in the talk where we can, uh, we'll go over where the value add can come in, in a very product. Here in the United States in 2016, you can see that even though there's oftentimes a lot of uh, conversation on how we don't have manufacturing domestically, in fact, over 60% of the value add of the clean energy technologies we are consuming was actually generated here. So um, again, this is 2014 to 2016, recognizing this is now 2021. This was, is a little bit old, but it gives an idea a way of understanding how we can benchmark where economies are. You can see in even just three short years in a couple of the different technologies, there's major shifts and it can help inform policymakers of where R&D could have an impact and help bring manufacturing back domestically or even just who our trade partners are to understand what is our risk geopolitically, you know, of where something might be being manufactured. All right, so I'm gonna show how you can use TEA for storytelling. And this can be really important, um, especially for researchers, for you to be able to articulate why should you get funding. Now, I have a husband who is a physicist and he has explained to me that he should just be funded because it's really cool stuff. And I totally agree. However, oftentimes when you're submitting your proposal, you, you need something besides it's really cool and gonna be groundbreaking because especially in the energy technology field, there is a desire to understand what will it take in order to have this become the state of art? What will it take such that this can displace our current technologies? And so you can use TEA to be able, even though um, it may be early stage, to, to, uh, to explain that. So the example I'm going to use today is LEDs. So how can we tell a story with LEDs? Um, so one thing to, and to know is uh, the building technology office of the uh, e, uh, of the DOE uh, funds a considerable uh, lighting technology research. And you know the question could come up of why would you do that? Because when you're looking here of where the dye and substrate capacity and production is across the world, and I grant you this is 2015, although there hasn't been substantive changes in the last few years, you can see that China basically has the uh, dominance in producing it, as followed with uh, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan um, on both the dye and the substrate. And you can see that the United States only does a little bit of this. So why would we as an entity want to continue funding research in lighting technology if we're not manufacturing the substrates and the dye? Well, it turns out in 2015, the U.S. lighting market, so the spiffy lights that we stick up in our houses and our offices and what, was $17.3 billion. Using trade flow, we know that we imported $3.9 billion of luminaires. And I'm, the word luminaire is now kind of the new language uh, because with old technology, you'd buy a fixture and then you put in a light bulb. With LED technology, those LEDs are obviously integrated. So um, basically a luminaire is either a fixture that you put a bulb in or an LED, a fixture that has the LEDs um, integrated. Anyway, this means that the U.S. manufactured domestically $13 billion in lighting products. That was 77% of the total revenue sold. And so then what we do is we look at the value add along the supply chain. So I showed you that in the earlier slides on the clean, um, the benchmark report where we were looking at where was the value add in the manufacturing. And so when you look at a luminaire, you see that there's only about 5% of the value in making the chip. And then those chips uh, for a commercial lighting product get integrated into packages. Typically, there can be anywhere from two to 10 chips in a package. It's a little bit depending on the, your product. And you can see that there's about 30% of the value then in, in a, the packages that the total number of packages that go into Luminaire. But 
that's nothing when it's all dwarfed by the overall value add that is in the luminaire itself. And so then to answer that question of why would we policy-wise want to invest in further research in lighting technology when we're not actually manufacturing the upstream product is because we're allowing downstream manufacturing and we're allowing the significant value add in the downstream. And so any advances in uh, lighting technology then incentivizes adoption, which then drives that $17 billion uh, luminaire uh, market. One of the other things specifically on this project we looked at is can we sustain that, right? There is a lot of focus and has been for a long time on the cheaper labor thought to be overseas and whatnot. And this is back in, this, this analysis was done back in 2019, 2018, well before we had all these shipping craziness that was going on. And so I believe global shipping was about three to six X cheaper at the time of this analysis. So at this point, it blows it all out of the water. But basically what this is showing is that when you take how, the cost of manufacturing a luminaire in each of these economies, and you add in the cost to get it to Golden, Colorado, because I figured, hey, might as well give it to myself, um, then it is significantly more expensive to manufacture in Mexico, Japan, and Germany. And everybody's like, well, yeah, we all know Germany's expensive. But it's also more expensive to manufacture in South Korea. And when you look, China, Taiwan, and India, specifically China and India, which people typically think of very cheap labor locations, you don't actually see a fairly large difference between the cost between shipping and manufacturing and if you were to do it domestically. It only is about 4% cheaper at the time this analysis was done to manufacture and ship from China. And then the other thing that one has to really think about with your product is then how long does it take to get to you? At the time of this analysis, if you manufactured in India and tried to ship it to Golden, Colorado, and that you figured that there was going to be no delays, the ship was just waiting for you to put your, your uh, container on it and come, it was still gonna take 50 days especially in high-tech industries like the LED is, well, that's a long time for your product to be in transit, and a lot of things can be happening in that. In, in that. And that 50 days assumed there was no delays. Now, thankfully, making my, my case even easier than it used to be, obviously there is a lot of delays that can happen with shipping. You know, right now I believe there are 90 ships sitting off the coast of California waiting for birthing to get unloaded. You know, you can have something go sideways. And you can just one one of the biggest hurdles right now with uh, shipping is there's not enough containers, or the containers are not positioned where they need them. And so, anyway, this basically tells the story of why could you like maintain domestic manufacturing, and why economically it still is actually going to make sense. A four percent like cost difference when you can guarantee that your product is going to be on time and on site when you need it is critical in, for instance, the commercial building industry, where any sort of delays like really affects your labor and your equipment rental fees. So, so yeah, um, there's still except for in Mexico, you're still going to have significant time to get here, and so so there's a lot of reasons therefore to both research LA, uh, lighting technologies and then realize the uh, gains domestically. Understanding geopolitical landscapes and technology impact. All right, so we were talking a little bit earlier on uh, lithium ion battery manufacturing. This is showing the complexities of that. Um, this is specifically for vehicles that manufacturing um, across the world. You can see that obviously China has a fairly significant piece of the um, manufacturing production, uh, I believe this is 2019. Um, you can see that the United States, though, is gaining. However, one of the things to take away is when you look at the components that go into a vehicle battery, the anode, the cathode, the electrolyzer, the United States actually has very little manufacturing of those. It is all being manufactured in China, Japan, South Korea, and then it has to like come over to us for it to be integrated into that battery. And so again, th that can then cause lots of hurdles along your supply chain, both if you just have what's going on with shipping delays, or if there's a geopolitical tiff with one of the major manufacturers, 
this can cause problems with you for that specific product. The other piece is if you even go upstream further to uh, raw materials, you can see the importance of lots of economies that we don't normally think about. When we're talking, you know, energy technology, very few people like have the Democratic Republic of Congo pop to the forefront of their mind. And yet, as you can see here, that's basically where the world's cobalt supply comes from. So any political instability in that region is going to affect all that upstream, or I'm sorry, downstream battery manufacturing I showed you on the previous slide because all that cobalt is needing to come here from the Democratic Republic of Congo. The other thing though, doing this type of analysis helps with early stage research is this highlights, there is a single point of risk with getting a material necessary for, for the batteries. And so this has actually caused the um, R&D world to like start looking into, well, how can we reduce or eliminate cobalt from the batteries? Because if you get rid of it, then you no longer have this potential problem. And so that is one of the, the, the ways that, um, that, that r and Sorry, that is one of the ways that looking at where material scarcities are, understanding where the materials are coming from can then help inform research and development is it can show that you have these single points of like possible problems and it can help incentivize there to be focused on that area, the research, as opposed to just increasing the efficiency, for instance. Uh, the other thing really kind of touching on the geopolitical piece is it's not always just about like crises like a tsunami, a volcano or whatnot, but oftentimes trade disputes can really have a volatile effect on energy technologies. This example was in 2010, the United States and China were having a dispute over silicon PV and the US put tariffs in 2010 on um, PV imports from China, uh, silicon PV imports. Um, now, instead of retaliating by putting a tariff on our imports into their economy, what China did instead is they put an export limit on rare earth elements. And it turned out in 2010, they were one of the primary um, economies that would uh, go ahead and purify um, the rare earth elements. Um, so it wasn't that they were mining them there, but they were all getting shipped over to China for those processes. And so the result was a 7x price increase on things. And specifically, I have familiarity with this for LEDs. You need to have those rare earth elements for um, going ahead and selecting your wavelength. And so then this caused serious problems. And it also shut down because, as we showed before, and South Korea's, but they couldn't get the necessary elements for their, their lenses. So um, just kind of as a way of understanding where what can happen from just trade disputes um, in your energy supply chains. Uh, another example, a little bit more recent, um, uh, if you keep track of the TV world, you would have saw that the Biden administration uh, banned solar from the Xinjiang province in June. Um, however, when you look at where global components are, you can see that China is a dominant player. And so that could have the potential to have a fairly large impact unless they can somehow show that the silicon coming out of China is coming from somewhere besides that province. And so um, there's a lot of uh, chatter in the news about how that might happen and what those impacts could be. But again, this just shows the importance of understanding the, ge like, the landscape of where these various components and such are coming from. All right, kind of tackling some other TEA tools. Oh, going more early stage research, understanding cost reduction opportunities. So um, I actually am currently working on a project on gallium oxide. It is a wide band gap material that could help empower electronics. So for all of those of you who are like looking at your laptop this morning and you have that great big brick sitting on your desk, there are power electronics in there turning AC to DC. And there is wide band gap electronics would allow that to be more efficient. And there are already wide band gap electronics in the market. Um, they're silicon carbide and they can increase the efficiency of something anywhere from 
10 to 15 percent to just a couple percent. But if you think about if everybody's laptop brick was one percent more efficient, think of how much energy this could save. However, gallium oxide has the potential to be cheaper um, because you can manufacture it cheaper than you can silicon carbide um, and also work at higher temperatures. But one of the pieces then of what I help the team I'm working with is, is there is not gallium oxide power electronics in the market. So understanding though where research could help make sure uh, if they were successful in making a power electronic product, it would have been cheap enough to manufacture, is we create these bottoms up um, manufacturing models shown here on the left, showing what the cost is along each process step if it was at volume manufacturing. Again, everybody knows the alpha prototype is gonna cost a lot of money. The real question is how much will it cost uh, when you're actually doing it at, in quantities? The other piece we did is we showed what would happen to the cost if you were successful from a research standpoint of doubling the life of the bowl that you grow the crystal in or making it twice as long. And we can kind of show what would be the impacts of these steps. The, another thing we can do is we can look at a system level. So we looked at uh, medium voltage motor drives, these, uh, and we looked at what if we did put wideband gap technology in that? Well, we know the wideband gap technology is going to be significantly more expensive than the current incumbent silicon technology. Um, but it turned out because you could make all these other design decisions because the uh, wide band gap had higher efficiency, it doesn't need as much cooling, that at the end of the day, that motor drive costs the same, even though the power electronic component piece was almost like 10x more expensive. And then we were able to show researchers that if they focused on making transformers cheaper, that that would have a significant impact on making these um, a lower cost and possibly getting them more widely adopted in the marketplace. Lastly, one of the things we can do is show system capabilities providing long-term savings. So for this specific project, what we were doing is we were comparing a 50 kilowatt silicon carbide based inverter to a one that was uh, incumbent silicon technology. Um, and what you can see over here on the right is that incumbent technology was significantly cheaper than if you used a silicon carbide based one. Basically, the silicon carbide based inverter added 11 cents a watt to your price. And this can be really a deterrent for people when you're doing your uh, your financials up front when you're like, well, why, why, if I'm going to do 50 kilowatts, do I want to spend 11 cents a, a watt more for the silicon carbide based inverter? And so what we showed is even though this overall made it about 5.3% higher than the benchmark silicon, the energy generation was 14% higher and that 14% higher. So we were assuming the same solar cells, same location and everything, comparing apples to apples. But because the silicon carbide was so much more efficient, you got 14% more energy. And so ultimately what that meant was the levelized cost of electricity, which is a benchmark that a lot of energy technologies use um, in order to understand um, how things compare, how do you compare solar against natural gas versus wind, was actually lower over the life of your project than if you'd went with the silicon one. So you, that 14% that more energy lowered your cost per um, kilowatt hour of energy. And so by spending more up front, you, got, um, you overall actually saved money. And so these, these are kind of the different ways we doing TEA um, can like look at a project and help give researchers information to help justify your proposals. It's how we look at information to try to inform policymakers of areas that would be good to invest for R&D and whatnot. And so um, that will take questions. Uh, hopefully, I think I've left enough time for them. Thank you very much, Samantha. I think your enthusiasm for the topic has come through <laughs> during this presentation. And um, I guess one of my takeaways is that there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to you know, energy technologies for research into new and different raw materials we might want to consider rather than just trying to make the existing better. But there's also opportunities for research into efficiency 
Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. And the first is, what are the criteria for the inclusion of clean energy categories in the benchmark report? For example, could significant adoption of energy optimized luminaires eventually cause the luminaires to drop off the report? Are there mechanisms for researchers to include a new category in the report? Jill, why don't you take this one? All right, great. Um, so the initial four technologies that were chosen for the report were done because they were uh, significantly large uh, markets uh, and they were growing and expanding markets. So, you know, solar, wind, batteries, and LEDs uh, are all very well and also very important to the clean energy uh, economy. So, um, you know, the size, the importance, and the growth areas. Um, so that's where they were included. Uh, and currently, I would say that is true at, definitely for still solar, wind, and batteries. Uh, I think your specific question about LEDs, they are getting close to, you know, being the majority of the market. Um, and I'll let Samantha talk a little bit about whether what she sees as possible growth areas in LEDs. I think if they were a continued growth area that they would need to be part of the report. Um, we chose the different countries based on uh, where the technologies are manufactured uh, and how much they contributed. So it was also in terms of the market size, the market size growth and the manufacturing growth and then kind of the global global nature of it. Um, we are uh, looking for funding to do another version of that report. Um, so there was an initial benchmark that was done for 2014 data. Uh, then we released this one that has the three years worth of data. We are definitely getting a lot of interest in um, people wanting uh, an updated version. Uh, it is quite an expensive report to produce because it a lot of uh, different types of data sets that require quite a bit of analysis to process the data into a form that can be used. So one of the things we are trying to find is a way to condense the report to be a more streamlined version uh, to be able to do it uh, more rapidly and in more real time and then seeking funding to do that. And then I think we would be doing an evaluation again of which technologies we wanted to uh, include in it. Uh, but maybe Sam can talk a little bit about the data sets that specifically went into the LEDs and, and um, what she kind yeah. of thinks of the market overall on those. Absolutely. Um, so w one thing we, uh, I tried to highlight during the talk was um, I'm not an economist, and so I don't totally understand um, how, what is uh, needed on the, some of the value add calculations. But one of the things is you need to understand the capacity for manufacturing. And so some of the technologies that are chosen is because you can quantify their their capacity. Like the example I gave of you know inverters, anybody can basically build their inver an inverter in your your garage. So quantifying the capacity of any given economy to do that is not feasible. And so so that that played a little bit of a part on choosing what technologies made sense for this type, this specific type of analysis. Specifically in the LED world, yeah, absolutely right. LEDs are becoming more and more the adopted technology, um, but as long as they are playing still such a big part of um, of the economy and such opportunities because um, while they are basically what you see in new construction, uh, specifically in the US, we actually have a significant retrofit market. Um, I think they'd still keep being part of the, um, the report, uh, at least until they were a, a significant piece of the installed base and there's a long way to go before that would happen. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Um, so we have another question on the topic of cobalt supply. And uh, the question reads, DRC supplies 54% of the world's cobalt. Do you have any idea of how much of their economy is driven by this trade? I'm curious how much it would affect their economy if the rest of the world moved from cobalt. So I, I guess, can't, oh, go ahead, Jill. I was saying, <laughs> um, yeah, so, the this is one of the challenges right on, on these raw material supply chains is because uh the the mining of these is done in countries that are often uh very in need of the economic development um but at the same time there's often concerns about the exploitation uh, my understanding is the drc is very dependent on mining uh, of which cobalt is one of those key areas um and that if suddenly all the batteries no longer needed cobalt you would um 
cobalt's used for other things, obviously, so the mining of it would not stop. But a lot of the growth in it has been because of of, of batteries. Um, so I think it would have a very negative effect on their economy. I think it's a very large part of their economy. Uh, cobalt is, my understanding, a byproduct of mining copper and other materials. So that mining would, of course, continue. Copper is very important to the um, energy economy. Uh, so the mining itself probably would not stop there if there was a significant change in the cobalt price uh, that that is done in in, in with, along with the copper mining um, that there would be there would be some effect. Um, so I think the challenge for uh, those of us in that are interested in manufacturing is to if there's concern about countries that have, say, a dominant um, effect on a particular product like cobalt and or are a country that is uh, very dependent on that and they have various environmental or human rights challenges, I think it's, it's incumbent on us to think about how we can improve those supply chains and improve the mining in those regions, uh, be able to diversify maybe do to reduce the dependence of the technologies on those particular materials. Um, but I do think we do need to be uh, responsible on in, in considering uh, the sourcing of those and how to help that, how to help the mining companies or encourage the mining companies to various global treaties or other agreements to improve their practices uh, to, to make them better, both for social and uh, environmental reasons. Thank you, Jill, appreciate it. Um, if there are any other questions, I encourage our audience members to go ahead and enter those now uh, using the Q&A panel on your screen. Um, but at this time, I, you know, I just want to thank our speakers very much um, for this informative talk today on a very timely topic. And um, we look forward to really expanding our collaborative projects through this new MOU between NREL and, and Georgia Tech. So we really look forward to uh, what the future holds, I think, for both of our organizations through that, through that MOU and our partnership. I'd also like to uh, mention that due to the holiday, we do not have a Lunch and Learn session scheduled next Monday. However, our next Lunch and Learn session will take place on Monday, October 18th. And uh, continuing the uh, energy theme, the topic will be lithium battery powered vehicle manufacturing and career opportunities for students presented by Brandon Haddock, the Director of Communications for Textron Specialized Vehicles. Um, I'll allow the, the broadcast to remain open for another minute to see if we have any additional questions come in. But again, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Samantha Reese and Dr. Jill Engelcox for a terrific presentation today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And you know, if there are questions after this is over, I, I know Jill's at least email was on the front slide and please feel free to just google us reach out and we're always happy to answer questions on any of these topics yes thank you very much and we will um, have the slides available publicly on on nrail's website so uh, we can send you that link page that you can share with others who will want to uh to check out some of the links we tried to include um references to where the the, the graphics are um where the some of these reports can be found uh if people are interested in digging more into them uh, and definitely if there's additional questions. Um, and then with the MOU, if there's interest in working uh, with, with us on any of these topics around supply chains, I think we'd be very interested into, into continuing this kind of analysis, uh, collaborating with you on this kind of analysis uh, and exploring these topics in more depth. So certainly if there's interest in, in pursuing that, um, contact either Sam or myself. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we'll take advantage of that <laughs> opening. And uh, to our audience members, also uh, today's session has been recorded. So within a within a few days, we'll post a recording of today's broadcast to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute website, the events section. So if you'd like to uh, refer back to this at any time or mention it to some of your colleagues or fellow students who were unable to attend today, will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. Thank you, Samantha and Jill, and thank you to our audience members. I think we'll close the broadcast today, and we look forward to uh, seeing our audience back here on October 18th. All right, thank you so much for the opportunity. Have a great Monday. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.